Welcome everybody to Buying Into Brooklyn. I'm Victoria Alexander and everybody's just gonna chill for a little bit while we wait for um, all the people that signed up for this class to log in. I say that there's 15 people on, but something like 70 something RSVP. So we're just going to uh, try to let everybody in and not start and give them the deep info until we're all on here. Um, but while we wait, if anybody wants to put any questions in, I can tell you a little bit how Zoom works. I always forget to, to do that. Is that um, right now everybody is on mute. Um, and we're going to save all of the questions till the end that there is a chat in the in the bottom here for you to um, ask us questions and you can either ask us directly or ask um, for everybody to see and then we can um, answer those questions at the end or email you afterwards if you don't want to talk with everybody here um, you can message clients uh, people in the um, group directly in if you hit participants and that's where you would unmute yourself as well there'll be a little bit red microphone next to your name in the participants thing so if you want to ask a question at the end when we're all talking you'll hit unmute um, anything else I should explain about how zoom works before we get started um, Yeah, put your questions there in the chat. Perfect. And there's not a lot of people on camera, but I'm gonna ask if anybody wants to raise their hand, does people, do people know how to do that? You can, next to your name, um, press raise your hand in the participants tab. So, or you can leave it in the chat. Is anybody here actively looking at listings right now um, or looking to buy? Yeah. Uh, no hand raising. Oh, I have one thumbs up saying that they are. Is that Tanika? Oh, and I see a hand here for two people raise their hand that they're actively looking. Jen and Terrell are currently both actively looking at listings. Um, are you guys looking in Brooklyn? Yes, and yes, and yes, yes. Oh, a couple people. Um, and Kaylin is looking for a condo in bed -Stuy. Cool. That is a hot market right now. Got some leverage there. Rashida and I are doing a deal. Well, I guess it's like bed -Stuy, Clinton Hill border mm -hmm. um, on Spencer Street for new construction in bed -Stuy together. And Lisa, yeah, we're all doing that deal together. I keep forgetting about on me. Um, Okay, it's 4.04. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Ooh, I'll go back to the beginning. Welcome to Buying into Brooklyn. Um, this is a class that I have been doing for about the last 15 years that I've been in business. Um, somebody wrote me earlier today I, that I think is on the Zoom uh, that they came to this class when we did it at the um, Brooklyn Brewery in Williamsburg with um, Brooklyn based, the blog, the Brooklyn blog. Um, and I was really excited to hear that that people came to the in-person version of this and not just the Zoom version of this. And we've been doing this now online for four or five different sessions um, from when COVID started back in April. We've tried to do one a month um, and I hopefully will continue to do them and we're doing a seller one next week. So if you own property and are thinking of selling, that's gonna be geared towards answering questions of sellers. Um, and this one is um, geared towards answering questions for buyers. So. Um, Uh, Lisa, Rashida, and I have done several deals together now at this point, especially coming out of COVID. Um, Rashida was actually my lawyer when I bought my house in Red Hook 10 years ago. And when I started doing um, very women-focused uh, 
marketing and targeting because that's as a female owned business, that's who I was really working with a lot. Um, I started working with Lisa, um, who really specializes in working with um, first time home buyers at Cost Country Mortgage and has been a really great um, addition to the team of Rashida and I and giving clients really high end, high level service for their for this experience. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in and get started. Oh, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Rashida, do you want to go first? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Rashida Sadiq. I've been practicing real estate law going on approximately 17, 18 years now. I'm like, can't believe it's gone this fast. Um, and seen the, the time when, you know, the markets kind of crashed, the Wall Street, all of that. So I'm kind of like a veteran um, in in lawyers now. And um, basically my practice is primarily real estate. I represent clients that are buying, selling um, condos, co-ops, houses, commercial properties. Um, that's my focus. And um, I pride myself on representing a lot of first time buyers. I have a lot of repeat clients, um, clients that have purchased their first property 18 years ago, and now they have full families and they're moving uh, throughout the year. So it's always great um, that this is something that I love doing. Um, I look forward to sharing my knowledge with you guys and um, answering your questions. Lisa. Hey everyone, my name is Lisa. I'm from Cross Country Mortgage. Um, I am a mortgage loan officer. Um, I've been in the business for a little over six years now. Um, I um, Cross Country Mortgage is a mortgage private lending bank. We work like all the big banks, but all we do is mortgages. Um, we do um, really any type of residential or commercial mortgage, um, but primarily, um, you know, we do uh, condos, co-ops, uh, single families, multifamilies. Um, I do work with a lot of first-time home buyers, and I love it. Um, and I think, you know, I really pride, me and my really pride ourselves on really awesome customer service and on moving you through the process as quickly as possible. And a lot of handholding and knowledge. You know, I think you're just always there to answer questions, which I and are always available. Um, so. Oh, thanks. I try. I, try. Yeah, I definitely try. I know it's, it's a tough process, man. We'll talk. It about is a that. tough process. process. Moving is never fun, and and especially not in New York. Um, it's very and can be very layered and complex. So, um, I'll introduce myself because I guess maybe I skipped that. I'm Victoria Alexander. I am the founder and owner of Realty Collective that I started 15 years ago when I wanted to defy the stereotypes associated with real estate agents. I work, mo I do not work with big developers. I only help small um, individual people with individual property needs. Um, so I started this class to be an asset and a resource to people and help prepare them for buying because I think that, um, you know, everybody says that that American dream is over with and we've moved on to new American dreams. But I really think that the reason that I've been able to stay in New York is I bought my house 10 years ago with some, um, a lot of great advice. And then uh, a real estate agent, because I, I, even as a broker, I had my own agent um, help me guide through the process that convinced me to buy my house. Otherwise, I don't think that I would own my house if that person didn't help me um, you know, get to that decision. So. Uh, I'm going to jump into the buying into Brooklyn where we're going to just go through sort of the process of everything and go over um, some complications due oh, to the COVID scenario. And then we will um, hold questions for the end and um, let you guys ask us anything you want and provide you after this with a guide that we prepared that have a lot of resources. So next slide. Okay. So why do you buy? Um, well, right now, it says the rent is too damn high. And in some areas, the rent is still too very high um, in parts of Brooklyn. Red Hook, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, the rents are holding, but rents are coming down in neighborhoods like Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. There will be a bounce back on rent and it would be, always be advantage to you to buy something so that you're not at the whim of the market. Because if you're in the middle of a lease right now, you can't really take advantage of your, the rents dipping. Um, and, but you should be able to take advantage of the really low interest rates. The other one of the other advantages of buying is designing it and owning it yourself and not having to worry about living with the mistakes or, you know, issues that a building would have that your landlord maybe doesn't want to address. Um, home ownership leads to long and short term equity and investment um, and that you're going to help build your, your personal wealth. So there's a lot of reasons to buy and money is just 
it's so cheap to borrow right now. So I don't cannot encourage people enough that if you're in the position to do it and you plan on staying in New York, you should definitely consider um, purchasing. The rent versus buy matrix. So there's actually a calculator that you can put all of your data in, into, um, how much you're paying in rent now, how long you plan on staying in New York, what interest rates are, um, how much down payment you have, and then it will tell you if the right thing for you to do is to rent or buy. Because if you plan on leaving New York in the, within five years and you're in a rent stabilized apartment, it's probably not in your best interest to buy because you don't have a long-term investment in staying here um, for several other reasons. So I think that using this calculator that we will send you a link to will really help decide if this is the right move for you. Um, and we're always happy to talk through you know, that as well because sometimes numbers are only telling part of the story. And then, so the first thing you do before you start going on Street Easy and you start going on Zillow and all the places you're gonna look at property is you're gonna assemble your team. And just like if you were, you know, starting a business, you would make a business plan, you would get a lawyer, you would take all these steps to prepare yourself for this journey and this experience so that you do it right and you don't make um, too many missteps along the way. Because um, mistakes happen and that's okay. There's no fear tactics here. It's just, you know, you want to be as prepared with as, as much information as possible and having a conversation with an attorney, a mortgage broker, and a real estate agent are going to help you be prepared. And then you're going to see if those people are the right people to work with you and represent you um, during this journey and experience. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people and you're going to trust them and you're going to want to make sure that they feel, you feel comfortable talking to them and that they answer all your questions. You also probably want a contractor, architect, and inspector um, at the ready so that if you, you're definitely going to want to do an inspection. And sometimes, you know, some things may seem like they're not going to be a lot of work. You should get a contractor or architect to give you some prices on, okay, I want to redo something. This is what it's really going to cost in New York. You might underestimate redoing your kitchen or bathroom, and that might have some headaches for you in the future. The other part of your um, process for assembling your team is making sure you have enough lead time. If your lease is up November 1 and you're just starting to look now, you might be pressured for time and that that will, you know, not make the experience any less stressful than it already is. Um, so making sure you have enough lead time to start going this. I have worked with clients for years preparing them for this moment and you shouldn't ever feel like you're looking, you're starting too soon because we all know in New York, it's really hard to get a down payment together and um, make sure that your credit's perfect and you're getting the best rate. So you wanted to have, as, if you're really committed to buying something in New York, if that's in a year or if that's in five years, there's never too early to start talking and having this conversation so that when, you know, the moment is right, and I know a lot of people feel that moment is now, um, that you're ready to go. Uh, do you guys have anything to add about assembling your team? Um, just one, just a get back on one of the things, the attorney, um, real estate attorneys, a lot of attorneys, they, special, they do different areas of the law. I, one thing I do, especially during this time, it's very valuable that you have an attorney that does practice real estate, that understands the process, that's available for you to answer questions, that can go over different scenarios, and that is also very flexible. Um, I think one of my, during this, um, I guess, COVID pandemic situation is that Real estate has traditionally a lot of hands-on um, and meeting in person, and now we've pivoted to being more online. And some of these attorneys that don't necessarily practice real estate, it's been very hard um, getting them to get from the contract signing to the closing. And unfortunately, that has harmed some of their clients um, and delays the process. So always good to speak with the attorney, ask them how long they've been practicing, ask them how along with you know what areas of the of real estate they practice in what um what parts of new york they cover um so definitely ask questions and the same thing with your mortgage broker and your real estate broker you want to definitely have those conversations um i i that's one of the first things i ask people is um who's your real estate attorney um have you started interviewing them yet and if they say my uncle i <laughs> definitely those are red flags you do want specifically someone that is New York City, co-ops and condos and apartment buildings here, 
because it is very different in the rest of the country and your uncle probably loves you and he thinks he's advocating for you but a lot of the time they're getting in the way rather than helping you so you just want to make sure that if their specialty is New York City real estate. And I say that to everybody, and you know, you don't have to pick the three of us here on this team. You wanna make sure that you're doing your due diligence yourself and picking somebody that you have vetted and you like, and that you feel like is the right match for you. Um, I'm slightly, I'm biased, obviously, because I like working the three of us. I have a deal right now with a lawyer. Um, I did a deal with him before for the client who referred them to me and he has not responded to one email to me he didn't return my phone calls and it is driving me insane not being inserted into the conversations because it's not i can't do the best job um for my client because i'm not part of the conversations and he's just not including me in any of the communication and i it held up the contract signing for a while because it was an issue and we couldn't address it because i wasn't didn't know there was an issue so making sure you have the right team is super important and I just also just piggybacking on that with the New York specific, um, it's, you know, along with everything that's just been said to make sure, you know, you have someone who has experience in what you're looking for and is available and all of those things. I highly, highly, highly recommend you do not call Quicken or Rocket Mortgage or 100%. any of um, Not only will they not give you the best rate or product out there at all, but they do not know how to do New York deals. Um, New York mortgages, just like New York contracts, is very, very specific. And um, and you know this this city just doesn't work like the rest of the country in terms of property purchasing or mortgage purchasing. So you just really need to be careful and make you know just make sure that you're getting someone that knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um, walking. Everybody's like, oh, I'm just going to call my branch or call my bank, and that also. I would advise against. They're just not gonna be able to give you the most competitive rates and most competitive products. You know, my bank is Bank of America. I didn't get my mortgage through Bank of America because thankfully I'm in real estate and I know better to not just call my branch. Then I got a bank a loan through MNT Bank because at the time they had a product where um, so I could get a co-signer but still do an FHA loan. I did some crazy complicated mortgage because I own my own business and those were the hurdles that I had to go against. But I had a mortgage broker that um, made sure that they offered me all the different products that were available and got me a great rate. So you want to have available all of the different products that are out there right now and not be limited to what your bank is offering you. And the banks have not been as competitive with the great interest rates that are happening right now. Just to echo what Lisa's saying. Okay, so. Um, Lisa, I think, you know, do you want to start talking about financing and we can jump sure. into a couple of things after that? Sure. So, um, you're starting to put your process together. Um, one of the first things that you're trying to figure out is how much can you afford and, um, what would a purchase price and down payment look like? Um, so you really want to talk to a mortgage professional pretty early on in the process because they're going to give you a really good assessment of what's possible. And that might be less than you think, but that also might be more. So it's always good to know what you can get pre-approved for before you start looking at things um, so that you're looking at things that are realistically within your budget. Um, there's a whole bunch of different options in terms of mortgages. Um, uh, like Victoria says, um, you know, I have all these different products. So my mortgage process is really personalized. I talk to you and I really figure out what you need. Um, you can put as little down as three and a half percent if you're going FHA to as much as 20 or 25 percent or more if that's what you want to do. Um, it really depends on if you're buying a condo or co-op versus if you're buying a single family home um, in terms of what might be possible in terms of down payment. When you are having a conversation about financing, um, basically what I'm getting from you is what's your income looking like? Are you self-employed or are you a W-2 employee? Have you been, do you have a two year job history minimum? Um, and then what's your debt looking like? Do you have a lot of student loans? Um, do you have a lot of credit card debt? Um, you know, because those are all going to come into the equation as to what you can get pre-approved for. Now, just because you, if you have a lot of student loans, that doesn't mean you can't get a loan. Those are just things we need to know about so that we, you know, put the best pre-approval package together for you. 
Some things to think about during COVID that are really important is um, if you're self-employed, that's been the biggest effect. You can maybe mute your phone. That would be great. Um, so if you um, if you are um, if you're self-employed, then what's going to happen? Is I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> um, so if you're self-employed, you're gonna have to show that you um, your business has been open and has been functioning during COVID. So we're gonna have to get information as to um, you know how much business you're doing right now. Now I have clients that they've been closed for a few months because of COVID. Again, that doesn't mean you can't get a mortgage. That just means you need to have a conversation with a mortgage professional before you start going out and looking at properties because this is part of the conversation we're gonna have. The good news is rates are so ridiculously low right now. It's amazing. Um, I just got off the phone with someone. This was for refinancing. Um, prior to this call and we were both like giddy because it's so awesome. I mean, you're looking at high twos, um, give or take, depending on your specific situation and what you're looking for, um, for a 30 year. For people who are looking to buy, why that's so exciting is because you're gonna be able to get pre-approved for, for more now than you were like a year ago. So maybe last year you were looking at properties and you could only afford three or 400,000 and you're like, that's not going to get me what I want. Well, now with interest rates being lower, you're probably going to have a much bigger buying power, which is going to help you find what you want. Well, you can't use that stove. It's terrible. I keep telling you there's plastic from when you put the, what you call it in there? Mommy, you put, um, Hey, One Loretta, of those can you hear yourself? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, so that's pretty much the pre-approval process. Oh my God, these people heard everything. Um, so that's pretty much the pre-approval process. Um, Victoria, do you want me to do more, some of these questions now, or do you want to wait till, till the very end? You're muted. <laughs> it's one of those technology days. Um, we can go through some of them more now. The thing that I was going to say about also the interest rates being so low is that, um, you know, something that was $300,000 a year ago and $300,000 now, the interest rate makes a really big difference over time what you're paying for the property. So if you end up staying in it for like 10 or 15 years, you know, the extra money you're borrowing, it costs you so much less to borrow it that, you know, five, you're probably having like, I'm trying to convince somebody right now they're offered $500,000 for a place and they want 505 and they're hemming and hawing over $5,000. I'm like, $5,000 is like $10 a month over a 30 year mortgage. Like, what are we really talking about here? And trying to um, exercise and understand what the um, value of this interest rate is really for people to realize that they have so much more buying power because it's so cheap to love to borrow money and it's historic lows and the interest rate is supposedly going to be staying this low for a while. Lisa, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit and yeah, then jump um, into the other questions. Yeah. Rates have been really consistent. Um, I mean, you know, um, like when COVID started, the market was really dramatic and rates were going up and down pretty dramatically right now. They're staying really consistent. Um, Rates for refinances might be going up a little bit soon, but uh, for purchases where, you know, I mean, no one has a crystal ball, but it's looking pretty consistent. So, um, so you know, I think um, even if they creep up a little bit, it's pretty amazing as to where the rates are now to where they were a year ago. So, um, you know, it's just more of a reason to sort of really try to try to take advantage of the buying power that you have now. And do you want to answer a couple more of these things uh, yeah, on the answer, slide or? I'll answer one of the questions now and then maybe we'll go through some of them at the end. So someone asked, um, if you own a rental home in another state, how does that affect financing when buying a home here in New York? Great question. So anything you own um, is, is calculated in your liabilities when we think of a pre-approval. So um, your that mortgage payment for that rental income will be used 
um, along with potentially if you have rent that you're getting income from the property that will be used as a profit as well it's the big thing you need to remember with mortgages is what you pay taxes on is what we can use so if you report your rental income and you pay taxes on some of that income on your federal taxes then we can use some of that income to assist in offsetting the mortgage um, so long story that's not a problem um, but you that's just again in your initial conversation with a mortgage professional something that they need to take into account Um, do we want to talk about any COVID um, things to consider when getting financing? Um, um, well, I talked about the self-employment. Um, the one thing that I'll say is one of the cool things that's come out of COVID is that, um, and I know Rashida will talk about it as well with the, the, the legal process, is it's made appraisals actually more flexible. So um, sometimes you get things called appraisal waivers because the deal works so well that you basically don't need an appraisal, um, which is really awesome. Um, they are also um, doing external appraisals where the appraiser is just seeing the outside of the property and then going on the computer and working with the realtor to get any additional information they need. Um, the one thing I do want to say is that um, talking about timeline, um, you're so this is like busier than probably any mortgage company has been in a long time. So um, you need to be realistic about time expectations when you're working with Rashida or your attorney to draw draft a contract. Appraisals are just taking longer because appraisers are so busy. So um, one of the things you need to talk about when you talk to your mortgage professional is what their turn times are. Specifically, you want to ask, how long after the loan is processed is an underwriter going to see my file? Um, that's really important because underwriting queues have been very long right now. So for example, at the big banks, it's sometimes taking three to four weeks before an underwriter even looks at your loan. That's gonna make it very hard to close in 45 to 60 days. Um, personally, at our bank, we really, we sort of, pride ourselves our model is on really fast turn times so um, our underwriters are looking at deals within seven to ten days which is pretty amazing so um, so that's again just another question that you really need to think about as you go to the contract process okay I'm gonna keep moving on um, to uh, I mean we can talk about this I was gonna say for financing should there be anything about losing your job or anything like that i think that was more in your contract and not so much with the financing to make sure that you know yeah, we'll touch on that with the contract yeah i'll go over some of that um oh, the one other question lisa though like what if you're right now applying and you're furloughed or you're on a depreciated um income because of your you know your employers you know say we're you're going to be at 70 percent salary because of covid what considerations should we think about in terms of that for so, applying so for a mortgage you have to definitely talk to your you have to bring this up in your conversation with your mortgage professional um and a few things will happen they'll either get documentation and they might be able to use that lower furloughed amount um depending but sometimes what you might the situation that might come is either um you get a co-signer on the loan so you get someone that could sort of co-sign the loan with you to help with the income um, that's needed for the loan or you restructure it and you put more down um, you know or figure out some other option to figure out but um, you have you're going to have to use your income that you're having now so um, so that's sort of the situation unless caveat if you're on furloughed right now but you have documentation or you know for a fact that you're going to be starting work in two to three weeks full time, then you know, then then that's a different situation because it's not open ended. Good to know. I think a lot of people are in that situation because um, they might have their down payment money, but they're waiting for their jobs and office to reopen back up. Um, so where do you search? So now that you have your dream team and assembled your um, experts that, that are going to guide you through this process and you're going to think of all these people really as your coaches um, and cheerleaders to help you you know get to the end um, you're going to start looking online with them um, based on some outlets and what 
markets you are. If you're looking in Queens and um, or the Bronx, I wouldn't suggest going on Street Easy. You know, the Manhattan and Brooklyn are really Street Easy territory. Um, Staten Island, same thing. Like you're going to be really relying on Zillow, which owns Street Easy, but doesn't. Street Easy and Zillow don't necessarily always talk to each other. So there are some complexities in where the platform is. There is a RLS, which is the Rebney listing service. So anybody that's a Rebney member would have um, access to this and then be able to um, source and pull all of the listings from all the brokerages, all the big houses like Corcoran and Halstead and Compass and us, like anybody that's a member in one place. So you'd have access and not have to sift through um, and then they make sure that the listings are up to date. So you don't see things on there that have been sold, but they're still showing up you there because the broker wants to, you know, have you reach out to them. Um, and just realize that every place that you're looking, when you find the property, the fiduciary responsibility of the broker that is listing that property is to the seller. They are looking out for the seller's best interest and that is their job, but they are not an advocate for you. They will try to get every penny and, and the best scenario for what their needs are for their seller. Um, and what you need, what is best for you, is it being advocated for. That is why you have your own broker and your own lawyer to sort of vet everything for you and help you make get through the decision and not what isn't the best for the seller. Um, so if you're searching on these platforms, just realize that they none of them um, put all of the listings into one place that you are really going to all the different platforms and trying to figure out where everything is unless you have the back end access that a broker would have. Um, so sort of narrowing down what you're looking for, you would figure out now what you're, if you're working from home or if you have a commute, um, what sort of amenities that are important to you in a neighborhood, um, easy access, access to outdoor space, lots of shops and restaurants, not every neighborhood has the same thing and what amenities you want. If you really want to live in a new construction that has a gym in the building that has um, access to all the subways, you're probably looking at downtown Brooklyn because Williamsburg has all those things but doesn't have access to a lot of subways. So based on building arch you know, architecture type um, is going to really steer what your neighborhoods are appealing to you. If you want to be in Park Slope, there's going to be less amenity buildings, more co-ops and condos, probably predominantly co-ops, um, maybe some townhouses, but then that's a totally different ballpark and price-wise. Um, co-ops have a lot more restrictions and um, hoops to jump through. You have to you know, do a co-op application, usually almost strictly 20% down. Some co-ops have more flexibility and will let you do 10% down. And then they have restrictions on if you'll let um, if they'll let them, if you, they'll let you rent out the apartment in your absence. So if you decided you wanted to go home for a year and work from your parents' house, the co-op might not necessarily let you rent out the apartment because they have restrictions on um, renting out the apartment. So some of your lifestyle choices and the quality of life you're looking for, as well as amenities and then building architecture um, in those neighborhoods are really going to drive um, where you end up and what you're looking for. Anything to add there, ladies? Good, got it. So making an offer. Making an offer, I'm gonna let, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Everybody always asks like, what are you supposed to offer? Where do I start with what to offer? And during COVID it's definitely been challenging where to start. And I have to say some deals have been, you know, back and forth a lot and people don't wanna feel like they're leaving money on the table and are trying to leverage the situation. But I would say that really it all depends on um, the seller's needs and that you shouldn't expect everybody to want to take you know or bend because of desperate times a lot of people are just up oh, i hear somebody again um are just um going to take what's best for them and not necessarily and wait for the best offer rather than let the circumstances drive their decision making so you want to be the people that are coming in right now for us for that are lowballing are the properties that we have we're not even countering them because we don't actually think that they're serious buyers. Same if they don't have a real estate broker, because there isn't somebody to guide them and talk to them through about all the challenges and get them to the end of the process. Um, so hopefully some of those people are gonna come back around to the property that we have listed that I think is great, um, but that they haven't, we haven't gotten the offers that we need yet. And we're just gonna wait until- Oh yeah, yeah, it smells so bad. Ah, I love that person. <laughs> doesn't know how to keep themselves on mute. 
Um, so then, so you'd make an offer with that offer. You are going to put in a revenue submit offer form. You're going to send in your pre-approval that we're going to adjust to reflect the numbers and the address that we are putting an offer in from Lisa or your other mortgage professional. And we're going to write a, I'm going to ask you to write a cover letter and I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of cover letters, but this is really for the people that, you know, might take a little bit less because they're like, oh, that's me five years ago, and they pulled on my heartstrings and made me feel really compelled, and I like this person, and they're gonna be great for my building, and my neighbors aren't gonna hate me for letting this person move in. So the offer comes with a couple things to sort of grease the wheels, um, and your, the broker that you're working with should be able to communicate with the other broker to give you an advantage. Um, and I think that, Rashida, you can talk about, is there anything COVID-related that we should be putting in our offer um, besides, you know, we always with the offer, it's financing contingent, contingent on an inspection. But now, is there anything else when we're at least putting the offer to consider? Um, well, more is for the contract itself. I mean, once you have your preliminary inspection contingency and um, mortgage contingency, that's primarily still not really for COVID. When you get to the contract, we start putting in more COVID clauses in regard to closing timeframes and things like that. Um, We've covered most of it. Okay. Right. And so, I mean, I think that prices have gone down. Um, it's hard to tell if they're, you know, how, when they're going to even out or, you know, if they're at their lowest. We do know that interest rates are really low and are going to continue to stay low. So if you have some time, maybe, you know, you can always watch the market a little bit. I bought my house at the financial crash of 2009. So I'm very aware of the indicators of what, you know, this time means for people, and it is a really good time to buy. Um, watching and worrying about it going lower, I would say take that second, because if you find the right property, um, that's the most important thing, because that is hard and if, usually not replicable in New York City. So you've put your offer in, you've negotiated back and forth the terms, and it gets accepted, and I think that's the next slide. Getting into contract, I'm gonna let Rashida take over all of this. So getting into contract, I kind of always tell clients initially when I speak with them, it's kind of like a roller coaster. Um, you've been on that line looking for your property, waiting online, finally you see the property, your offer has been accepted, and then all of a sudden you're at the beginning of the line and you have to get into contract, especially these days, pretty quickly. Um, and how quickly you get into contract depends on the type of property, whether it's a condo, a, a co-op, or a house. Um, the reason it's really fast is because until you sign the contract and the seller signs the contract and it's fully signed and sent back to the attorney, you are not in contract, which means that another buyer can come in and can put in a higher offer. Um, had that recently where a client did her inspection, they were ready to sign and then the, buy, the seller got another offer. Um, I had another deal recently where um, we sent back contract signed with the down payment and the seller got another offer. So it's not until, unfortunately, some sellers, until they sign it and send it back to your attorney, you are not in contract and that your offer is, is, is just an offer. And there's no penalty, you know, there's no ramifications because you're not in contract until it's fully signed and the down payment has been given. Um, so if you're buying, I'm gonna start with basically your house first. If you're buying a house, you definitely have to do your inspection prior to signing. So your offer is accepted. At the same time, as soon as your offer is accepted, the next step is scheduling your inspection with an inspection company. So when the attorneys are um, negotiating the contract of sale, you wanna go ahead and have your inspection so that's not a holdup. You can generally be in contract on a house within a week, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on how quickly that inspection happens, the report comes back, whether there are things that still need to be be negotiated regarding credits if there's some major items that have to be taken care of or there's repairs that have to be added to the contract of sale. Um, if you're buying a, a condo or a co-op, there's this part that we call as due diligence, which means that we have, to, uh, we have to review the building to make sure that it's sound financially. We get the financials for the last two years. We get the offering plan. We get amendments. We speak to the management company. We review the board meeting minutes. Um, so that process can take sometimes up to a week, sometimes more, um, because we are relying on the management company, or if it's self-managed, 
the person on the board to get us all of these documentations. And a lot of these management companies, they're working remotely. They're also swamped with refinance questionnaires or individuals that are buying as well and need questionnaires and due diligence. So their turnaround time with getting us documentation can be up to five business days. Um, there's fees that they wanted you to pay in order for them to answer questions. So we have to coordinate to get that from either the client or have your attorney pay for it up front. Um, we have to review minutes. Before COVID, we would literally go into their office and schedule and sit in their office and review the minutes because they are not allowed to release it from their office. Now the management company, some of them have us sign a, um, a non-disclosure, so we can't share it um, with, um, with uh, outside of the people that are in the transaction. Or some of them are being a little bit more flexible and they'll email us the, um, the minutes. I've recently started going back into the management company's office because they are starting to let individual attorneys come in to review the minutes in person. But once again, that due diligence portion is can take a little bit of while if you're buying a condo or, an, or a co-op. Um, and if you're planning on doing an inspection, if it's a smaller building, I always tell clients do an inspection for a co-op or a condo. If it's a bigger building, 100 plus units is sometimes at your discretion, but it's always, you know, at least go in and review to see, make sure before you sign the contract, because the contract states you're taking the property as is, you understand the condition of the premises, Yes, things have to be in work and order, but typically it's if the window was broken when you saw the property and they haven't agreed to fix that window, then when you close, that window can still be broken and it's no, um, you don't have a recourse to tell them to fix it because you've already signed the contract of sale. Um, going into contract for COVID-19 considerations. Thankfully, we in the beginning, there was a lot more kind of restrictions on moving in if you're buying a, a condo or a co-op. So a lot of the closings were delayed. We weren't able to have in-person closings, so that affected it. Um, now we're putting in clauses that have the option that if we go into a quarantine or we go into kind of where we were before, that we can extend the closing time period without having ramifications. And if the buyer isn't able to extend their commitment, they have the option to cancel the contract. But first you have to have the option to extend it first and in good faith try to get your commitment extended and your rate extended. So those are one of the main clauses that we're now seeing um, added to the regular contract in regard to um, extending closing dates and canceling it. If the buyer loses, their, um, loses employment due to a COVID-19 issue, we're trying to put those type of clauses in there so you have the option to cancel the contract and get the return of your deposit. Because for a contract, once you sign it, there's typically two contingencies. One is your mortgage. If you're buying a co-op, then it's the co-op approval. And then the other is title. They have to give you title, good title to the property. But the main contingencies are your mortgage. And if it's a co-op, it's um, your approval process. But if it's a condo, or a house, your only main contingency is really gonna be your mortgage contingency. And as I said, title is good, but typically the title stuff we can work out. Thinking what else? Um, I know you had mentioned appraisals. So Lisa, you had mentioned appraisals. So that's been coming in um, recently. We do have, with the frenzy of what's going on, I've had clients recently come in that are buying, that are waiving their appraisal contingency or waiving their mortgage contingency or trying to do that. So what I've had to advise them and as real, you know, speaking to the realtor, look, this is what's gonna happen. What if it comes, the appraisal comes in 50,000 less than what you entered into contract? Do you have those funds to come up with that additional funds? And a lot of times they're like, oh no, we didn't think it may, you know, we hope to appraise it, but we, didn't, we don't think it may appraise for less than that. So we try to keep a cap that if, it come, if the appraisal comes in maybe 10,000 less, yes, I'm able to come up with those funds, and because the market is so crazy and people are overbidding and you're having these bidding wars, I'll still go forward with the transaction. But we definitely want to try to make sure your attorney is discussing any ramifications. If you're waiving a contingency, that you understand the ramifications of that waiver. And there's ways that hopefully you can kind of, you know, get around it so that you're not totally waiving it, especially if you can put in like a COVID-19 clause where it includes a funding that if you get your mortgage commitment, 
there's a step that comes after that where the bank has to clear the loan, which takes a, maybe a couple of weeks after that. And if they're not able to clear it, you have a right to cancel the contract. So there's different other um, ways other than your mortgage contingency to try to protect your down payment as a buyer. Um, I think there was a question um, earlier that they asked about how um, finding a real estate lawyer. Um, that's good. Most people, I've had clients referrals from realtors. I've had clients find me on, from Yelp. You always want to research your attorney, speak with your attorney, but definitely utilize the internet, utilize your friends, ask them, have they, who are they working with? How well, how is your experience? Ask the realtor as well, because as I said, some of these clauses, you want to really make sure that it's vetted and included in the contract of sale um, when you're speaking with your attorney if possible. Yeah. I always suggest that people ask, pull, if they, I send them my list of people that I, you know, I have a list of three people that um, I always recommend for both mortgage brokers and lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa and Rashida are on the top of that because we're a badass team together. Um, and then um, I then ask people, ask your friends if you know anybody else that bought, talk to them. Who did they like? What did they like or not like? So that you have some perspective on, you know, other people's experiences with that person and the other people's experience of what they didn't like possibly in their lawyer to make sure you look out for those red flags when you are interviewing people. Um, we're all doing jobs here. You should be interviewing and talking to people and treat this like a job. Um, you're hiring somebody to do work for you um, and paying us all in some way. I don't get paid by you. I get paid by the seller's broker. So there actually is no cost, but you still want to feel comfortable and that you're hiring the person that's going to best advocate with you and you like talking and spending time with them and they understand your needs because you know, I'm going to be on the phone with you a lot and showing you property and talking through your decision making. And really, you know, you have to live in these places. You know what you want. And it's just really helping you get to that place with a lot of concessions probably made because I would love to live, you know, in a place I probably can't afford. And so under, <laughs> understanding what your, where your needs and the market actually align is part of my job as well. One thing I did, um, forgot to mention, but one of the other things that's happening a lot now is remote closings um, and also a lot dealing with wires. So also one important thing with when speaking with your attorney, because you want to make sure that they're practicing and they have insurance because you're wiring, you know, that 10% or 20% to that attorney. And yes, we are covered with insurance, but you want to make sure that they're getting it as escrow agent and they're delivering it to who they want. Thankfully, practice in 18 years, I've had it, had any issues with another attorney absconding with funds, but it is a lot of now with a lot of wires, we get, you know, we get, we get these emails and we always tell our clients before you send a wire, please call us to verify our information. I will speak to my client. You do not send a wire without verbally confirming that information with your attorney first. And as an attorney, before I send a wire to another attorney, I verbally confirm it as well. Um, so we want to make sure, especially now where a lot of the um, down payments, closings are, um, closing are be, being sent via wire. The contracts are being signed um, electronically. So it's a good way. DocuSign, Adobe has a signature provision. And old school, you know, print, sign, scan, and send it back to your attorney. Um, but these are things that are happening now that before it was all wet signatures. You would have to meet with your attorney in person, sign the contract, give a personal check, overnight that to the other attorney. Now it's Zoom meeting with your attorney, wiring the down payment, signing the contract electronically, and sending it over to the other side's attorney as well. And then also clients will have to close sometimes with powers of attorneys where you're given that right for your attorney to sign the documents on your behalf. Um, I had a closing this week where they were buying a house um, in Long Island and the wife was eight months pregnant. She obviously, now we're doing a, um, we're going back to um, closing in person. She didn't want to have a closing in person. So she was able to give me power of attorney. I signed all of her documents. After closing, I sent her a packet. So they have everything. So there's different options now um, to make the clients feel comfortable and make sure that you're doing um, what's, what's necessary. The other thing that's happening online is co-op interviews. So if you are buying a co-op, I'm most likely um, going to have your co-op interview over Zoom. Um, and there's a little bit more tweaking and protocol etiquette to 
um, to, to think about when you're doing a Zoom um, interview, co-op interview, because your charismatic outgoing self is not gonna translate as well over Zoom. Not serving me either. <laughs> but um, so that's just something to think about, um, that your paperwork is, needs to really be stellar, but then also some just really basic tips on uh, doing a Zoom co-op interview. I've now done a handful with clients. Um, it's very interesting and weird because I can't be there. Um, I, you know, I still am having the prep call and going over do's and don'ts for um, the interview because you definitely, you know, there's topics you want to avoid and avoid certain habits probably while you're in the interview as well on Zoom. So um, I think that that's it for the, so now we're having electronic closings. Is there anything else you wanna talk about with closings, Lisa, before we open it up for questions? Um, no, I think so. Just, you know, um, it, just to piggyback on what Rashida said, it's, you know, a lot of it's being done virtually or um, remotely um, now with COVID. And, um, you know, this is uh, getting to the closing table that it really on the mortgage end goes back to what I was saying about turn times and quick process, because you're not going to be able to schedule a closing until you get a clear to close from the mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if you're doing a co-op, you can't schedule your co-op interview until you have a commitment letter from your mortgage, which means that you've been through underwriting. So that's when, you know, all of these things really come home to roost in the sense of it's really important that, you know, when you're having your interviews, when you're talking to people, when you're reaching out on Yelp or to your friends, that you're getting someone who is responsive, but also realistic with you of the timetable. Um, and not just saying like, oh yeah, no problem. We'll get you that commitment in two weeks. That's, if he's saying that, then he's not giving you an adequate understanding of what's going on right now. So, um, so yeah, but, uh, but yeah, besides that, maybe we'll just take some questions. I, I mean, I'm just going to echo what Lisa's saying is that for us, there's some serious red flags when talking to people um, about the other experiences when they're interviewing people. For me, since you guys are all buyers, like there's a red flag for sellers when I'm always going to talk to a seller about buying their property. I say, you know, you don't have to pick me. Do not pick the person that has given you the highest number to sell your property because that person has given you that number so that they get the listing. It's a tactic. It's not a very, um, uh, I don't, I don't, it's, it's not a good tactic because it's, we'll just spiral into a whole bunch of other things. But um, we're all looking at the same data and information that this person is giving you that number as a bait to get you to list with them. And they're not actually going to be able to deliver on their promises. And so you want to make sure that everybody you're talking to, that you've talked to a couple of people, that everybody seems in line with it. And there's one person that's like telling you something extremely different than everybody else. They're probably telling you that information in order to, um, you know, be a salesperson and get you to sign up with them. But I would say that that is a red flag and that you should consider, um, you know, take that in consideration when making your choice. Um, so we're going to ask, going into that, somebody, the last question that somebody had, which I think is a good one, um, is about how the, the fees associated with hiring people. My fee, since it's paid by the seller, is based on the sales price of the listing. Um, and But Rashida, you have a flat fee, right? Yeah. So we give a flat fee for um, whether it's a co-op or a condo. Um, we give a flat fee for that if you're buying. Typically, it's between 1950 to $2,500. Um, if you're buying a house, then it'll still be around the 1950 to 2250 range. Um, for sales, is different um, pricing, but we give a flat fee. We, um, we um, you do have to give a retainer up front, a portion of that, but the balance is typically paid at closing, and it's not based on the purchase price. So you could be buying a five million dollar property, and you'll have relatively the same legal fee than if you're buying, you know, a property that's. 200,000 or under or something like that. But you all get the, the same, same level of, of service. <laughs> yes. Right, For, no matter what the, the, the expense is. And Lisa, what are your fees usually? Uh, so um, the only fee that we collect is a um, application slash underwriting fee. It's paid at closing. It's um, $11.95, it's a flat fee. And that covers everything. Um, so that covers you know everyone involved in your mortgage process. That's the only fee that comes to us. Um, the, all the other fees that are collected go to like the appraiser, the title company, Rashida, the state for recording fees. So those are, those are all included in what we call the closing costs. Um, but that's the only fee. Most of them are third party. 
Um, what I do always give my borrowers, especially first time borrowers, once you have a better idea of where you are in terms of what you're thinking of purchase price wise, we can give you a closing cost worksheet. So you have a bit of an estimate of what's, you know, the skin in the game, so to speak. Um, I always do it a little conservative because I want you to be prepared for more and then hopefully it'll be a little less rather than the other way around. Um, the last thing I'll say, actually in an interview with someone, they asked me a really good question, which was how I get paid personally. And I get paid from the bank and it's based on loan amount. It's not based on product. So, um, so I thought that was a really interesting question. So there's the a mortgage professional should never direct you towards one product or another based on, you know, they get paid differently. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what they want is for you to close on your home with them and have the kind of product you want. Um, somebody said, um, asked a question that I thought was good about the due diligence process for new construction versus a co-op or condo where you are that are established, Rashida. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't have um, access to finances and board minutes, et cetera, because it's new construction. Mm -hmm. um, they would want to know what, if they ask what they could be skipping, but I think it's just a different review of due diligence material. So yeah, so for new construction, we as I say we don't you don't have board meeting minutes, you don't have the financials. So what's really important is that offering plan and any amendments to the offering plan that we review, and they're required um, by law to disclose any changes to the offering plan to the attorney general's office because they have to approve the condominium um, before they're even. Um, able to start closing. So that information in the offering plan is pretty accurate um, because if they make a material disclosure that can be very, ad um, yeah, that can put them in trouble with the AG's office and give you right to cancel your contract. So part of the due diligence for a new construction is us reviewing the offering plan and any amendments. Also, I speak with the attorney for the building to find out realistically where are they in the process? Have they, um, declare the plan effective, which means they have enough individuals in the contract. When are they realistically um, looking to close? I always say for new construction, if they're telling you they're looking to close in October and they haven't started closings yet, or they haven't had certain steps, add three months onto that because they're inevitably gonna have some delays with the Department of Buildings, getting that certificate of occupancy, the Attorney General's office is backed up, they have to approve amendments. So just add three months onto that closing thing. I try to put into my contract an outside closing date because generally your standard offering plan, you can be in contract for a year without having that right to cancel, which you obviously don't want to if they're telling you it's going to be, you know, two months, three months later. So we try to put in a medium um, with an option for you to cancel before that. And typically when they, if they're approving that medium, then I'm like, okay, realistically, they're going to be looking to close then. If not, and they're like, oh no, we're telling you your outside closing date isn't gonna be until June of 2021. And they're telling you we're looking to close in November. Ding, ding, they're probably not that close to closings um, at some point as well. Rashida and I did a new construction deal last year that the person was in contract for over a year. And we just, luckily they, they rode that, that timeline out and we're really happy at the end because then their property had appreciated in that, in that year that they, they held on to it. Yeah. Um, he so, had the option to cancel, and he had. Yeah, he didn't, he, but it was happy. such a good. It was such a good deal. He had. He did have the option to cancel, but we, you know, he held on because mm -hmm. the value of the place and the new market a year later, it was going to be a lot. More, that broker wanted us to cancel because they, <laughs> they were going to be able to sell it for more. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, good stories about what has happened in the past that we all have lived through so that we, you know, can call on um, as experts to help guide you through the same scenarios because um, that's what we do. Uh, were there other questions? Somebody was asking about the New York real estate taxes um, as part of your, they're asking about monthly versus yearly, but that's part of your um, escrow. So Lisa, do you want to talk about the, how the real estate taxes are? I mean, yeah, it's, um, it's really property specific. So it's going to be, there's no like general percentage. It depends on um, whether it's a condo or a multifamily doesn't have a tax abatement. So when you're looking at properties, you're going to see um, in the listing what the tax is per month. Um, and then what's going to happen is when you create an escrow account, 
at closing, the the escrow, the mortgage company is going to take um, typically eight months, six months taxes plus two months reserves to establish an escrow account. And then when they, um, when your taxes are due, they will pay it out of that escrow account. The reason they're taking so much at closing is because you never want your escrow account to be too low and then they have to come back to you for a bill. Um, if you don't want to do that, you could always choose not to escrow. If you do that, the rate goes up a little bit, but then you don't have to come up with those escrow accounts at closing. But then be prepared, come September, you're gonna get a tax bill that you have to pay. It's interesting because upstate by taxes are escrowed, but their school tax is separate. So mm -hmm. I got a separate school tax. I know, Lisa, you do deals upstate too, right? Mm -hmm. I do deals all, all throughout the country, but okay. I, my, focus, my focus is really um, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, um, I do deals upstate. I've done deals in the Poconos, um, people who live in the city that have bought like a cabin there. Um, so, so yeah, it's always, um, the taxes are really always county specific. Um, when you close, part of what title is doing is confirming those tax records and when the tax payments are due. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the job of title to get that to you before closing. Yeah, and um, one thing that I try to do when I'm going over the contract with my clients, whether it's a condo or a house, I'll try to pull the taxes for the property. Um, and especially if it's, um, you know, a condo or new construction um, to see what their tax, whether, you know, what's the status of tax abatements, if there's a tax abatement on the property. Um, and then obviously when the title report comes in, I'll get that full information to reconfirm, but I do try to get a heads up on it prior to client even signing. So when I'm going over your closing costs, I normally say, this is the taxes, there's a tax abatement on it. So this is the taxes without the abatement. So take that into consideration as well. Um, someone's asking um, about capital gains and the timeline for selling if they thought six months, but read one year for the capital gains period. I'm assuming they're talking about 1031. Okay, so, um, so before, I guess the rule now is that if you have a property and you've lived in it two out of the last five years as your primary. You have an exemption of 250,000 for individuals, 500,000 for um, a couple. Um, if you are buying and best selling investment property and purchasing another investment property, there's this thing called 1031 exchange where you're deferring your capital gains because a lot of it can be pretty high. Um, so it's definitely something you want to consider if you're buying and selling. There's reverse 1031 exchange, but that can be an entire topic of another seminar just on 1031 exchange. But for, let's say, the first-time buyer, um, really capital gains, if, I mean, first, if you're selling your property and it was your primary, even if, like, maybe one of one, you, it's a two-family, you lived in one of the units, you can potentially use that part as your primary and then the second unit is your investment property and do a 1031 exchange and certain type of tax, tax ramifications there. So there's, speak to your attorney and definitely your accountant, but that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> Does anybody wanna ask questions in real time and not on the chat and talk to us or we're gonna send all this information out afterwards and follow up for everybody, um, share the home buyer guide like I mentioned, um, any other questions before we wrap things up? And I just want to thank everybody so much for participating and asking great questions. And I hope you enjoyed this and we'd love your feedback. Um, and please get in touch with any of us if you have any questions um, and want to speak one-on-one. -on -one. We're all very available and want to um, help as much as we can. Oh, thank you guys. I, I have something to ask. Oh, here we go. Yes, go ahead. Um, sorry, I can't see my video and I am like literally my sweatpants. pants. So sorry. that's okay. Um, there's a big trend on like Instagram where like millennials are buying, you know, old houses in, you know, like whether it's New Jersey or Iowa or whatever. So I've definitely been looking at that, you know, because I, I am furloughed and I have a lot of money laying around. But how scary is that like renovation wise? Like, so when it comes to like Brooklyn, you know, what would you guys even bother to say like, yes, okay, so the bathroom isn't working for me, so I'll fix the bathroom. Like, what kind of considerations does one start with when it comes to this? Um, so I'll, I'll feel this a little bit because I'm, I, that is my, my 
territory here. So I, I'm assuming you're looking at like this old house or something like that. There's a couple great Instagrams that I also stalk. Um, yeah, like, yes, um, and that seem really appealing because they're great houses with great architectural detail and you're just like, you know, you're drooling over the front porch. Um, but for me, as somebody that like is familiar with renovation, I don't buy anything that I can't drive to and I'm not probably gonna drive more than five hours. I convinced my husband to buy a house in the Catskills over Vermont because he wanted to be close to skiing, but I was over five hours of driving to skiing. It just wasn't, you know, I can't, I can't do that all the time. It's exhausting yeah. for a weekend. So anything that I would drive to, if you're buying in the middle of nowhere and you don't have, the, the, the precautions that I'm very aware of is like, if you don't have people there, you don't know anybody else there and you don't have your resources of your experts like your contractors yeah. your plumbers, well, I'm, all those I'm pretty people. I'm pretty comfortable around like the distances like I have a kind of a freelance career so like I'm a photo editor I can actually work do most of my job remotely and I could just come to New York for like six weeks you right know, um, my family in Philadelphia I, I have an idea but of you that. would actually move to this other place yeah I don't know I guess the consideration is like more what do you as like a first-time buyer what do you never go near like what, what sounds very scary. And if you were to do something like this in Brooklyn, like buy something that you want to fix up, what are some of the potholes that you just run across? Oh, stay away from the money pit. If you've seen the movie money pit, stay away from that house. Um, I mean, have a really good inspector, really good inspector that brings up all the like huge red flags that you are not going to see. Oh, you can see the roof is deteriorated. You can't see that the foundation is cracked or the foundation is sinking or that, you know, it has radon. Like you want somebody that, and I like already had a problem with this. I want the house I bought upstate. We had an inspector. The inspector was not that great and missed a bunch of stuff and it cost me a lot of money afterwards fixing mistakes that were in hindsight he was like this is termites i'm like oh i i know how to deal with termites but it was actually water damage and water damage had rotted the bottom of my house and i had to you know gut the whole thing and then do a lot more work than i planned on doing so i think that you know having the right team of people is the most important part you if you're going to buy in the middle of ohio you need to go there and you need to vet the plumbers and the contractors and all the people that you are going to hire because you are trusting them with your equity and your asset and then they can bleed you dry if you pick the wrong people. Um, the house I bought the person from who was an architect I thought she had fixed the floor and paid someone to do it and they fixed it the wrong way. So even with like you know the right people saying that you can still be the pitfalls of making these sort of mistakes and just you have to hire that person got recommended to her by her plumber and i'm still working with her plumber and he's like that's disappointing because i recommended that guy and i feel awful because he messed up so you know just really vetting that you have the right team of people i'm never going to be know how to do plumbing i'm never going to do electrical it's just not something i'm going to learn how to do i know how to rip up floor i can do a lot of some of the work myself yeah. um but you know i've done a lot of habitat for humanity so yeah. i've like built some of the studs and done all that kind of stuff. So it's yeah, just, the demo, all, with all this extra time, it, it's getting very tempting. <laughs> yeah. There are some really beautiful places out there. And if you can work from wherever, then, you know, and you want that space, do it, you know, and, but just find something that's not at all of your pennies, like find yeah. something that's like, okay. <laughs> and if I have to rent it out, is there, is it in a college town? Is it someplace that, you know, you'll be able to rent it to somebody and not be at doing it at a loss? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. Okay. Sorry for the noise earlier. My mom is staying with me and it's really challenging, no especially working from home and with my mom. But quick question. Um, I was living in New Jersey and my mom lives in Brooklyn. So I've been staying because due to medical reasons with her. My question is, what would your advice be to someone like me? I was living in New Jersey in a condo and I no longer have that. But um, I'm looking around in Brooklyn and it's very expensive. But also to the other situation is about three years ago, I got really sick and I wasn't uh, lost my job due to that illness. So I am working now, however, um, and I'm starting to save in six months. I saved about like 20,000. Um, what would you suggest? Because my credit, unfortunately, when I got sick, the bank would not accept like partial payments. So I had to like default on the credit card look credit card so unfortunately my credit scores a uh, credit score is not as stellar as it once was so what would you suggest for someone who's actually because i really don't want to rent in brooklyn it's extremely much more expensive than new jersey which is crazy to me but it is what would be your advice i think that's a great question for lisa 
Um, so I think your first advice would, my first advice would be for you to get on a call with me or another mortgage professional so that we could go through a lot of the details. You're go, we're going to need to run your credit or um, we're going to, whoever you decide to work with is going to need to run your credit to see what we're working with in terms of your credit score and what's reporting on your report. Um, if you have a lower credit score um, and you're, you know, in terms of the prices in Brooklyn, it's, you know, something like FHA might be a very good option. Um, FHA is a bit more forgiving in terms of credit scores than um, more conventional loans. Um, the issue with FHA, though, is that um, if you're going a condo, for example, it has to be an FHA approved condo. So you have to, so it cuts down what you can find a little bit, but it also gives you some more options with that credit, with the lower credit score. You, um, it also depends on, you know, um, on a few other factors in terms of your income, you know, how, what your employment's like now. Um, if you can't do a loan now, what I would suggest is, again, when you're reaching out to your mortgage professional, they can put you in contact with a credit repair person. Um, you know, there's someone that I work with a lot that I really like. Um, and basically, a conversation is free, and they can look at your credit report and give you some advice. They can also work with you where you pay, um, you know, a small fee, and basically, they work every month to do things to repair your credit. And so I've had clients that have done that and it takes some time, it's not overnight, but like within six months, their credit score has really improved and that opens up more possibilities. So I guess my first advice would be, you just need to really have a conversation with someone, have them run your credit and then go from there. That sounds great. If you could like maybe say the name of the person, cause I'm also not very sure who to trust us who to go to because I never had to do that before I think if you want to you could reach out to me um via email, okay. and then we can sort of go from there and start in terms of setting up a call and Loretta Perfect. that's Lisa you can just and you're gonna get an email with her contact information after this for signing up for the class so um Great. I'm gonna take one more question and then we're gonna sign off as it's getting late but um uh somebody's asking about um the reserve amount and that if that's required in New York City, um, definitely for co-ops, they're gonna wanna see a certain amount of funds of the um, maintenance fees, management fees um, into, the, into your bank account to make sure that you're gonna be able to afford to pay your maintenance for the next couple months ahead of time. And so they have a calculation based on the, um, their requirements. Uh, I don't know, Lisa, are, other, are the lenders asking for extra funds? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going through the chat with Sherry, so now I understand more, Sherry. Um, mm -hmm. So when it's an investment property, more reserves are required. So um, the idea being that if it's an investment property and something happens and you have to not pay a mortgage, you're not going to pay your mortgage first on your investment versus your primary. So, um, so that's why all, all banks require um, more reserves for investment than if it's a primary. Um, that doesn't change with COVID. That's just always been the case. Um, so, um, so yeah, reserves sort of depend on purchase price, what you're buying and whether it's a primary, a second home or an investment. There's, um, there's a lot of really great questions still here. I think that we tried to chat back to people asking, you know, um, some of the answering some of them questions if we didn't get to talk about them, but seriously, please just reach out to us. We're happy to talk through any of these scenarios with you and answer all of your questions. Um, you know, no strings attached. It's just, we want to be a resource and be helpful because this is a really exciting journey for people and um, want to make sure they're armed with as much information as possible so that they can commit to the process and, you know, become full-time permanent residents of Brooklyn if Brooklyn is where you're deciding to buy. Um, so I want to thank everybody again. Thanks, Lisa and Rochelle.